This has been May, and I want to thank you for being with us as we continue to seek the old past. We are at such a crucial point in our study of the Bible. We have reached what is the climax of the Bible story, and that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a very uh, just such an emotional time, such a triumphant time. And when it looks like all is lost, the disciples will find that no, it's just it is just now starting. We have looked at the life of Christ and the seven um, points, you might say, an outline of his life, the years of preparation, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the great Galilean ministry, the period of retirement, and then the close of Jesus' ministry, and then the last week. In the last week, we further divided it into the conflicts with the Jews, the Last Supper, the trial, and now we have seen his crucifixion, and when we left last time Jesus had made that grand announcement it is finished while on the cross those seven great sayings of Jesus so important and that last one it is finished and father into your hands I commend my spirit oh what what a triumphant thing that was it is finished everything the Lord had come to do now he's done except now he will be raised from the dead. But we'll see in our time this time together that the disciples did not understand that. As many times as Jesus had told them, they just did not get it. We talked about how they, they led Jesus away to be crucified. And then we, we talked about the terrible scourging that he endured. And then the time on the cross is broken down from the times that we know from like 9 o'clock in the morning until 12 o'clock at noon, and then from 12 o'clock at noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. In that afternoon time, which should have been the brightest time of the day, there was a, a total eclipse of the sun. We talked about after the, our Lord died that there were various miracles that were seen surrounding his death. We talked about the earthquake where the tombs were open, and after his resurrection, many bodies of the saints were going to come forth and, and appear to, to many in the city. We talked about how the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom and how people smote their breast as they left that terrible scene and how even the centurion who was in charge of, of this says surely this was the son of God. They had a way of making sure that the ones suffering on these crosses didn't stay up there if they were ready for them to die. They had a way to make sure that they did. Oh it was not a quick painless way the Jews had asked Pilate to have the legs of the men broken to hasten their death because, see, this was a high day. This was uh, the day coming up uh, in a couple of days, two or three days or so, was the Passover. And it was more special because it was part of the, of the Passover observance itself and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And so the soldiers go up to each of the two thieves and they break their legs. Because what that would do is would cause the prisoner to suffocate. Because remember we talked last time how they had to push up with their legs to get a breath and lower themselves down to exhale. And with their legs broken, they could no longer do that. And so death would soon come. But then they came up to Jesus and they saw that he's already dead. Remember, he said it is finished. And so they didn't break his legs. But just to make sure... One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and blood and water came gushing out. As with so many of the other details, this too fulfills Scripture. In Psalm 34, and verse 20, it said, Not a bone of him shall be broken. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, it says, They shall look on him whom they pierced. Say, our oh Lord is... These are not random acts. These are things that God foretold hundreds of years earlier would happen there on the cross. There's a man named Joseph of Arimathea, and he goes to Pilate, and he asks Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, this was a, a brave act that Joseph did because he was a wealthy man. He was a member, actually, of the Sanhedrin, but he had not consented to the Lord's uh, guilty sentence. 
but he was also a disciple of Christ, although secretly because of the position that he held. But when he goes to Pilate, Pilate is surprised that he's already dead, and so he sends to make sure, make sure he's dead. And of course, they confirm that he indeed was dead. So Joseph brought a linen cloth, and he brought 75 pounds of spices, myrrh, and aloes to prepare his body for burial. In that climate, decay would set in very rapidly when a person has died. And so this was in preparation for the burial. Now, 75 pounds of spices and, and all of that would, would have been a small fortune at that time. There was another man there named Nicodemus. Does that name probably sound familiar to you? He was the one that came to Jesus by night. He also helped Joseph. Joseph placed Jesus in his own tomb where nobody had ever laid. Now, some of the women who were followers of Jesus, they made note of where he was buried. You can just imagine, see them kind of standing off and they're watching all of this because, see, they had planned to go and anoint the body of Jesus themselves. But again, all this is fulfilling Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 9, it says, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. There he was, hanging between two thieves with the wicked. And then there a rich man was, putting him in his own tomb that he had prepared for his own self. And yet there the Lord lay in the grave, the tomb of a rich man just as God, through his prophets, had foretold hundreds of years earlier. Now Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph sat near the sepulcher, and, and they're watching again how he was laid. They, they want to know where is he so they can go back later. They go home and they prepare more spices and perfume for the burial, but they had to rest because of the Sabbath day. Remember all this happened on Friday and now now the Sabbath day has approached as um, Friday night e evening uh, would have marked the beginning of the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath day has come and, and so they have to go home and rest. And on the Sabbath day, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate to request that the tomb be secured. See, they they, they knew that Jesus had said he was going to be raised from the dead. They seemed to have an understanding his own disciples didn't have. In fact, they said things like, oh, you know, his disciples might come and steal the body away. You know, that deceiver said he was going to be raised on the third day, and his disciples come, they steal the body, and, and now this will be even worse for us. And so Pilate said, now you just go and you make it as secure as you can. And so what do they do? A seal was placed on the, as they rolled the, the stone in place, they placed a seal on it to make sure nobody tampered with it. And they had a guard there of soldiers to watch over it. The entire Bible story now has been building toward this moment. There the disciples are disheartened. They think it's over. There the soldiers are standing guard, lest they should come and try to steal the body away. And, and no, that's not going to happen, they think. Wicked men had rejected Jesus, and had, they had had him crucified, and God is going to declare that this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He's going to declare that by raising him from the dead. There was a violent earthquake, evidently early that first day of the week. An angel from heaven comes and rolls back the stone, and he sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes as white as snow. The guards that had been posted there, they saw him, they trembled, and they fainted dead away. Well, they, 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 there was nothing they could do. Later, we'll read in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 19 and 20, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? There was great power being manifested at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, nobody else knows that this has happened. And very early on the first day of the week, at, at dawn, 
Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, and the other women, they came bringing those spices. Remember, they had to rest on the Sabbath day, and early here they are. They're, they're ready. And they wonder, now who's going to roll the stone away for us? They, they had seen how they had laid Jesus, and then the, the great stone was, was placed there. They evidently did not know about the detachment of soldiers that had been set to guard it because they had left before the soldiers had been sent. They didn't know about the Roman seal that had been placed on the stone to forbid anyone from removing it. They just knew there was a great stone there, and, and who, who would roll it away? You know, people, the skeptics, the unbelievers, they say that really what happened is this, that Jesus fainted on the cross, and later he was revived, and well, you think about that. Jesus was mistreated all night. He was scourged, which often causes death. They crucified him there on the cross. He was there for at least six hours. Earlier, he had been too weak to even carry his cross. Once they believed him to be dead, just to make sure, the soldier took and pierced his side, and, and, and uh, blood and water came out from around his heart. Joseph and Nicodemus, who were there to anoint the body of Jesus and put the body in the tomb, they thought that he was dead. He remained in the tomb while the great stone was there and the guards posted on the outside. And yet somehow, according to this theory, and it's called the swoon theory, somehow he rolled away the stone by himself and defeated the guards. Now that would have been quite a feat, wouldn't it? for a person that had not been crucified and scourged and crucified, let alone here, a normal healthy person could not have done that. And so we dismiss that as just the skeptics trying to explain away this wonderful event of the resurrection of Jesus. And so the women, they, they get there to the tomb and they see that the stone had been taken away. Now that taken away implies it was with some violence, not just rolled away, but taken away. Perhaps lying there flat on the ground. There were no guards. Remember, they, they had fainted dead away and, and evidently had left. And Mary Magdalene, she left the women and went to find some of the apostles. She didn't go on inside the tomb. She immediately leaves. The other women went into the tomb and, and find that it's empty. But two men in dazzling garments were there. At first, one was sitting on the right side of the tomb, and, and, the, and the women were frightened, and they bowed low at this sight. And one of the two men, one of the angels, said, Do not be afraid. You seek Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. Why do you seek the living among the dead? I love that statement. They said, He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid Him? Can't you just, in your mind, imagine this scene? And they said to them, Remember, remember how He talked to you while He was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be given into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. The Lord had told them. In Mark 16 and verse 7, the angel goes on to say, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They were just in shock. Well, Mary Magdalene, she ran until she found Peter and John and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And so Peter and John, of course, they run to the tomb. Now, John being the younger of the two, I suppose, is the reason he outruns Peter. He gets to the tomb first, and you can imagine John stops and he's looking inside. But Peter, when he catches up with him, being impetuous as he is, he just runs right on in to the tomb. And he notices that the napkin which covered Jesus' head was not lying with the clothes, but rolled up in a place by itself. And you think, what is the significance of that? Well, if someone has stolen his body, why would they leave the napkin and such behind? But anyway, John, John now he goes on into the tomb. He sees and he believes that, yes, the, the, the body is not here. 
See, up to now, they had not realized the message of the scripture that Jesus would rise from the dead and, and they each go home. They still don't, they still don't get it yet, but they're getting there. Luke says that Peter left wondering in himself what had happened. That first day of the Lord's resurrection, there, there are five appearances that we know of that are, that are recorded for us. First to Mary Magdalene, then to the other women, then to the two men going to Emmaus, and, and we'll talk about them, to Simon Peter, to the ten apostles and the others with them. Oh, our Lord's going to show himself sufficient times to, to convince them that he indeed has risen from the dead. Now, a after telling Peter and John about the empty tomb, Mary Magdalene goes back. She returns to the tomb, and she's just standing out outside of it, weeping, and she looks inside the tomb, and, and the angels were there and, and said, Woman, why are you crying? And she says, Because... They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have put him. Can you just hear the anguish in her voice? Then she turns around and she sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. Maybe it's because of the tears and through her tears. And he asks her, well, who are you looking for? And, and Mary thinks, well, maybe he's the gardener. And, and maybe the gardener, maybe he's taking the body of Jesus to another place. If so, she, she offers to take the body away. Just show me where you've laid him. And Jesus says, Mary. And turning back to him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means my master. Jesus tells her, don't cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. He sends her to the disciples to let them know that he will be going to his and their Father and God. Jesus is assuring her that he will be here for a while, but don't, don't cling to me. I, I'll be here a while, but I'm going to my Father. What Mary does is Jesus told her. She's going to go and tell the apostles. The book of Mark tells us that Mary Magdalene was the first to see Jesus alive. Now, the other women, as they hurried away from the tomb, Jesus met them and, and they said greetings to everyone. And that was just kind of a, hey, how are you kind of a greeting. Astonished, they fall down at his feet, worshiping him. And Jesus also tells them, go to and tell my disciples. And, and, and they are to go on to Galilee and they, they'll see me there. That's what Jesus had told them earlier on before his crucifixion. Just a comment now about these women, because that's mainly who we've seen so far, isn't it? Though women were not chosen to be apostles, and though they were not chosen to be leaders in an official sense for his, in his cause, it is clear that they were among the Lord's most faithful and devoted disciples. It was the women who first saw the angels. It was to women that Jesus first appeared after his resurrection. They are so important, and they are still important to this day in our Lord's cause. Mary Magdalene had found Peter and John, and now the other women arrived with their news about Jesus. The disciples heard the words of these women, but they just still didn't believe them. Their words seemed to be kind of like nonsense. Now, in the meantime, the guards, <laughs> they, they got to go back and report in. Can you imagine the story they have to tell and, and how nervous they are about, about doing that? They hurry to the city and they tell the chief priest all the things that had happened. I have to believe they told them the truth. And, and yet with the hardness of heart, the chief priest, they, they meet with the Sanhedrin and they agreed to pay a large sum of money to the guards to say that while they slept, Jesus' disciples came and stole the body away. The guards were assured that if word gets back to the governor, they would intervene for them. And their story was accepted and continues to be spread to the current day. Kind of a lame story, wasn't it? <laughs> that somehow they were so inept that they were sleeping on the job and so sound asleep that they didn't hear the stone being rolled away and the disciples still in the body. It really doesn't make sense, but that's their story. And as we say today, and they were sticking to it. 
Now, the, the soldiers, it was not a great concern about disciples stealing a dead body. It was not the same as if they had been guarding a live prisoner. Then their lives would have been in jeopardy had they let that prisoner escape. It could be that the soldiers went to the chief priest because they felt it was a matter for the, for the Jews to handle, and yet their story was so foolish, and, but they had no better explanation. So they continued in their hardness of heart and in their unbelief. Now we find that there are two disciples. They leave Jerusalem, and, and they're walking to the village of Emmaus, and that's about eight miles away. And as they were walking, they're talking, of course, about the events of the day. Jesus joins them, but their eyes were restrained, so they could not recognize him. And he asked them, well, what are you talking about? And they were surprised that he didn't already know. Are you the only stranger that doesn't know what's happened this day? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and in word before God had been put to death by crucifixion. They thought that their hope had been crushed because of his death. They said, we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. And now some are saying that angels appeared at his tomb saying that he is alive. And some disciples went and found the tomb empty, but they didn't see Jesus. See, they didn't know about any of the other events up to this time. Now, Jesus got on to them, reproved them because they were so slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. He said, was not the Christ supposed to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And starting with Moses, Jesus went through the prophecies concerning himself. I would have loved to have heard that. What a sermon that would be. Well, the two men insisted that Jesus stay with them that night. And, and so they turn in now for the night, and they're about to eat supper. And as Jesus always did, he blessed the bread for supper. And then their eyes were open, and they knew who he was. And he vanished from their sight. And in Luke 24 and verse 32, it says, They said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us? when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. Oh, what an emotional day this is. Well, now, what are they to do? They had turned in for the night, but they immediately now turn around and go back to Jerusalem. But before they told their news, they, you know, they get to the group that's assembled and they immediately say, the Lord really has risen and has appeared to Simon or to Peter. And then the two men, they told them about how they saw Jesus on the road. And the disciples still found the news too astonishing to fully believe. And now the stage is set for Jesus to appear before the whole company of disciples that have gathered together. So we read in Luke 24 and verse 36, Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. They were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. They're still thinking, this is just too good to be true. And so Jesus asked them, do you have something to eat? And this was to prove that he was not a ghost, but he was flesh and blood. Finally, the disciples accepted the truth of Jesus being alive. And Jesus reproves them for not believing the evidence of his resurrection brought to them from the eyewitnesses. Jesus says to them in John chapter 20 and verse 21, He said, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when He has said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. These last words were part of the final instructions Christ gave to the apostles. This was not the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in baptismal form. That had come on the day of Pentecost. This was a further promise of that occasion that was to come. But you know, there was one disciple who was not there. Thomas. Thomas called the twin. 
the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Sometimes we, we give Thomas trouble. We call him Doubting Thomas, don't we? I think we've, we've been a little bit too hard on Thomas. Remember the other disciples? They didn't believe either until they had seen the evidence by the Lord himself. They didn't believe what the women said. Jesus is going to, to appear to many during the last, or during the rest of the 40 days. He's going to be with them. See, the Lord is with them for 40 days during his resurrection. During this time, he's going to appear to the apostles a week later. Seven disciples, he's going to appear to them by the Sea of Galilee. At one time, he appears to 500 disciples, in fact, more than 500 disciples at one time. He's going to appear to James. The apostles are going to be given the Great Commission according to, to Mark and Matthew and Luke. And then there's going to be the Ascension. There's no way to know the exact order and exactly how many times that the Lord appears to his disciples, but there's plenty of times. There are plenty of witnesses to the Lord's resurrection as they are go going to go forth and carry out the Great Commission. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Oh, the Lord didn't, didn't go back to his father without fully and firmly establishing that he indeed had been resurrected from the dead. Now, let's go back. Let's go back. Remember doubting Thomas. He said, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it with, with my own eyes and feel and touch it myself. Eight days later, this will be the first day of the week again, while behind closed doors, with Thomas with them this time, Jesus appeared to them. And he said, Peace unto you. Turning to Thomas, Jesus told him to touch his wounds. He said, Do not be without faith, but believe. Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. In John chapter 20 and verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Oh, God's Word is written to produce faith that we might read and we might see the prophecies being fulfilled, to, to, to have it firmly established in our own hearts that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thomas's belief is one of the strongest testimonies to the resurrection. Like all the disciples, he didn't just accept the first thing that he was told that, that somebody saw the Lord alive. He said, I've got to have more proof than that. And when he got it, when he did see Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. That's the strongest kind of affirmation of faith in Jesus and in his true identity. They were not pushovers. It took some convincing. But all that ought to strengthen our own faith. There are other things to tell about before our Lord ascends back into heaven. I thank you for being with us. Won't you join us again next time as we continue to see this great story unfold and as we prepare now for our Lord to ascend back into heaven and sit down at the right hand of his Father. And as always, let's seek the old paths. Dry.